Hello, hello, welcome, welcome. Take your seats if you haven't already, please. And also some of these reserved signs, um, if you haven't, if you don't have a seat, feel free to just help yourself to one of those. Um, so hello, uh, thank you all for joining us tonight for what I know is going to be a provocative and deeply meaningful conversation on the idea of home. Um, I'm Amy Kish of AKR and Collect for Change, one of the curators along with Candace Huey of Re-Riddle and Suzanne Zuber um, of Rehome, which is a For Freedoms exhibition examining the plight of political and economic refugees in the Bay Area. We're honored, deeply honored, to have an incredible brain trust um, of thought leaders and creatives joining us for this town hall tonight. Um, it's truly an embarrassment of riches, so thank you all for being part. Um, before I introduce them, I want to offer some context for the conversation um, by sharing a bit about the exhibition. About a year ago, I was asked by the Goethe Institute to look back on a trajectory begun by the conversation um, from the exhibition Making Heimat, Germany, a Rival Country, that was the German pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Uh, the exhibition was curated by the Frankfurt Design and Architecture Museum following Angela Merkel allowing unprecedented numbers of immigrants to come into Germany and the controversy that that provoked. Um, the Goethe Institute picked up the charge after that exhibition um, and asked 11 curators globally to come up with an exhibition about what did these themes provoke in your city. So I was asked to be the curator in San Francisco and the three most salient issues in the notions of displacement and being a refugee uh, led not only to looking at the status of political refugees here, um, but also economic refugees. We may not have refugee camps, but we have encampments of homeless throughout our cities, and a stone's throw from that is the fact that our creatives can no longer afford to stay here. So what was key for all of us was dissolving these boundaries between what human displacement looks like in our city. Um, so the artists that are in the exhibition upstairs uh, look at these three issues. They look at immigration, our status as a sanctuary city and kind of that being encroached upon under the current administration, um, issues of homelessness and the support that is lacking in our city currently, um, as well as the support to creatives and that you know we have and continue to lose creatives on a, on a daily basis. Um, in addition to the exhibition, we also have, uh, and what was important and key to us, was connecting people who came to see this exhibition with the organizations that are working on the front lines of human displacement. A lot of them are here in our um, esteemed grouping of um, participants tonight, um, and I'll introduce them in a little bit. We also have um, a For Freedoms reading library. Um, for those of you who don't know, For Freedoms is a platform for civic discourse led by artists that was started by Hank Willis Thomas and Eric Gottesman. And um, this exhibition is kind of falls under that umbrella. And as a result, we have this For Freedoms town hall here tonight. And the library I was mentioning, which provides reading lists for kids, adults, teens um, about these issues of displacement. Um, Finally, the one thing I want to mention about the exhibition is that uh, all of the artwork, and we also have a pop-up shop that's part of it as well, uh, is being uh, offered through Collect for Change, which is a platform that uh, invites artists to personally select an aid organization that's working on an issue that resonates with them, um, that a portion of all sales will go to. So the exhibition falls under that platform. On a personal note, I just want to um, share that this has been a very deeply meaningful uh, process working with Candace and Suzanne and the entire team. Um, there's a whole cadre of people, Kim, Wei Ying, a ton of other people that aren't in the room right now that have really made this be part, in addition to Minnesota Street Project, who's been absolutely amazing and allowed this to, um, us to call this our home uh, for the month. But um, my family came to the United States as refugees in 1935, fleeing Nazi Germany. So to be asked by a German uh, cultural institution to look at these issues and how they're 
basically being invoked in our country right now was sadly poetic um, and deeply meaningful. So I really want to thank the Goethe Institute um, and Astrid Kammerling in particular uh, for really supporting this project um, as well as uh, an entire community of people, some of whom are here with us tonight, and I'll introduce in just a couple of minutes, um, as well as our sponsors, um, people who really came to aid and support and, and make sure this could be realized to its, its full vision, uh, which is the Facebook art department, as well as Pamela and David Hornick. Um, so we have this amazing community here tonight, all of you, so thank you for that. And we have this ama amazing community up here as well, so I want to uh, introduce a couple of the people. So we are deeply thrilled to have Mark Bamuti Joseph, who um, was the former chief of pedagogy and programs at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and has been tapped to be the vice president and artistic director of social impact at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. But he will continue to be a Bay Area resident, so we are not losing him. We are just loaning him. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and then um, we also kind of, I'll kind of point out and maybe raise your hand so people can get to know you as we, you know, continue to develop relationships in this exhibition as part of the community. Katie Anand um, from Kids in Need of Defense. She's one of the attorneys who's on the front lines advocating for these kids. Um, Denise Sandoval of Lava May. Um, Taylor Duckett, author, songwriter, um, founder of Conviction to Change Publishing. <laughs> Terrence Lester, uh, founder of uh, Love Beyond Walls and the Dignity Museum. Maybe he can share a little bit, he'll share a little bit more about what that is. And then artists and activists, uh, T. Bui. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rodney Ewing. Ana Teresa Fernandez, who happens to be wearing one of Yasko's, uh, Sko Habibi's amazing creations. We'll introduce him in a second. Allison O.K. Frost. Yasko Begovich. Deborah Rappaport, who's one of the co-founders of Minnesota Street Project. Andy, the other co-founder, is, you know, seeking refuge in the back right now. Um, Sharon Maidenberg, director of Headland Center for the Arts. And Owen Levin from Community Arts Stabilization Trust. So really an amazing grouping of people. And part of that group and that family is also, um, we're going to begin uh, tonight's town hall with a reading from the incredible book, I Am Home, Portraits of Immigrant Teenagers. Um, Erica McConnell, who will raise her hand hopefully, is the brilliant photographer who's really captured um, the, the essence and stories of these folks, along with Rachel Newman, who is the editor. And T. Bui. Um, so they're going to tell you a little bit more about this amazing uh, book. And we also are honored to have uh, three of the students who are featured. They are all students at Oakland International High School, which is a school that was developed to um, particularly respond to the communities in the East Bay who are immigrant communities um, through multilingual offerings and a lot of other things that Erica and Rachel and T can tell you about. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to T. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, just wanted to tell a little story about a, a, a little school in Oakland, California, um, that started in 2007. So it's, it's in, a, in its 11th year now. Um, I was one of six scrappy teachers and one scrappy principal who started this alternative public school for recent immigrants and English language learners. Um, the idea was there was nothing like it in California. And in California, uh, recent immigrants at the high school level were graduating at a rate of about 35% in California. Um, and there is this uh, model that existed in New York and a little bit in Massachusetts that worked. Um, that was 
that created schools that were entirely devoted to the needs of kids at the teenage level who had just arrived, needed to learn English, and also needed to graduate high school in a very short amount of time. Um, it usually takes 10, 15 years to master a language, and most of them have just a few, uh, not to mention all of the other obstacles that you have to overcome to get used to living in a new country. Um, so this school started with uh, about 65 uh, students, mostly freshmen, but honestly it was a pretty wide age range of like 13 to 19 year olds coming from 30 something different language groups. Um, and it grew slowly into a full-fledged school um, that is beautiful and represents um, countries all around the world. Um, the students speak almost 40 languages and um, bring this cultural diversity that would knock your socks off. Come, come visit in North Oakland if you can. And if you live here in the city, the sister school, San Francisco International High School, started a few years after, um, and it's nearby on DeHaro Street. Um, I'm incredibly proud of the students um, for getting, first of all, just getting out here on a, on, on a weeknight, um, and for um, being so grac graceful with a lot of attention on them. Um, it's not easy to tell your story in front of a bunch of strangers, but that's what they're going to do here today. And um, what they do is beautiful because it, um, it, it changes the narrative that we often tell about the very people that we're trying to help. Um, we don't need to pity people, we just need to listen to them and they will tell us what they need. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Rachel. Rachel. Thank you, T. Thank you. Um, Zen Buddhist teacher and monk Thich Nhat Hanh, who has um, spent most of his life exiled in France, often asks and has asked me, do you have a home? You may be lucky enough to have a roof over your head to keep out the rain. You may um, even have a door that opens and closes and maybe locks. But do you have a home? Do you have a place where you can rest? Do you have a place where you are grounded? Do you have a place where you feel safe? Do you have a place where you belong? I was born and raised in the East Bay, in Oakland, um, the child of, grandchild of immigrants. And growing up, even though I lived there most of my life, I was often asked, but where are you from? Which reminded me, was a good reminder to me to um, talk about where I was from and to mention the people who had come before me and my ancestors. And I think because of that, and also because I've had the double-edged privilege of being born and raised in a country that was built on displacement and genocide and appropriation and assimilation, I have always been most interested in these questions of belonging. Liza Richheimer, who's here tonight, and Lauren Markham invited me to come to Oakland International High School during one of their career days to talk about book publishing with their students. And I came for a few years, and then one year I asked the students, how many of you have read a book in the past month? And they all raised their hand. And then I said, how many of you have read a book in the past month that reflected you, that you saw yourself in? And no one raised their hand. And I said, how about in the past year? And no one raised their hand. And then I said, how about ever? And one student raised their hand. And so together um, with Eric McConnell, we went to the school and interviewed students about what home meant to them, where home was for them. Um, we took, and Erica took pictures of them in a place, one of the places they felt they most belonged, Oakland International High School, one of the places they most felt welcome. And so this project, I Am Home, was first for them to see themselves reflected. And it is also for you. 
to deepen your own sense of belonging, and to see and hear from these future leaders we are lucky enough to have in our town and in our midst. So I'd like to invite Laura, Fatima, and Angel, I'm oh, sorry, Jeanette, <laughs> Fatima, and Angel to read their pieces and tell their stories. We're gonna start with Fatima, and then she will pass it, the mic on. And so please enjoy this opportunity to listen to them. Hello everyone, my name is Fatima, I'm from Senegal and I'm 15 years old. Um, I've been asked the question, what does home mean to me? And I said, home means to me a safe place to express yourself and co a comfort zone. A safe place to build memories, love, happiness, togetherness and family. When I think of home, I think of a family living together. I feel most at home when I'm with my family, with friends and at my house. Hello, my name is Janet, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about my story. When I was five years old, I lived with my parents, with my grandmother and my two brothers, in a big house near to the little forest. Outside, there were chickens and children playing. There were so many kids. I lived in San Salvador. When I was chill, it was easy, because I didn't know what happened outside of my home or what happened with my neighbors. I just played with the other kids, but I got older, I saw that there were a lot of guns there. Every night, I hit a lot of gunshots. I feel dangerous. Soon, I couldn't walk outside at night. My grandmother didn't like me to go out, outside. Sometimes, it was okay to go outside for a little while during the day, but not for a long time. My mom was in the United States and she would call me when, whenever she called. She was here like, when I was eight years old, she came here, so I passed a lot of time without her. We would always talk to her on the phone. I, wouldn't, I would come home right after school. Often, I would sit in our big and beautiful garden. It was full of all kinds of fruit, orange, guayabas, and mango, and it smelled really, really good. I came to the United States almost four years ago. There's a lot of cars in our neighborhood. Sometimes the neighborhood come, come out and out of the, of the car, but they don't play outside, like in El Salvador. The, the air here is so different than I grew up. Maybe it's because the trees are different. The air in the Salvador was so fresh. My grandfathers and grandmother are still there. I want to visit them, but I can't. I like being with my mother here. I miss her. I feel safe here. The only thing I don't like here is the food, because it's very different than my home. <laughs> Wherever my brothers and my mom are, I think that is my home. Because when I was, I mean, when I'm with her, I feel very safe. But that's why I miss my grandmother and my great grandfather in El Salvador. Hello, I'm Angel Chavez Martinez. I'm Janet. Mar I'm the Janet's sibling, and I'm from El Salvador too. <laughs> right on. I live in El Salvador most of my life for 17 years. When I was a child, I lived with my mother until I got sick, and she came here in the United States when I was uh, six. I went to five different schools from when I, when I was in kindergarten to 10th grade without repeating a year. For 12 years, 
I didn't live with my mom, but I live with my siblings and grandma. She protected me and helped it to keep my safe from violent gang gangs and I stay safe by staying inside with my siblings. I have been with my mother uh, and my siblings since May 11th, 2016. Now I live, now, now we live together and I feel thankful that she remembered me and is now taking care of me right now. <laughs> School is very helpful me to keep to keep me my knowledge growing and my English has been improved a lot since I've been here for two years. I I have only been able to talk to my grandmother one time. I want to know how she is and if she is safe. I want to stay here, but I love my home country because of culture and many nostalgia memories. And I won't forget where I'm, where I'm, where I'm from. <laughs> uh, my home is here now with my family, but the only that I care is everyone, especially for from from people from different countries and. I love all countries, especially everyone in the world. Um, this is my friend. She's absent today, but I'll speak for her. She said, my country is Senegal. I like my country because there are so many people there, obviously. I like the food, it smells so good. Yeah, it's true. In my country, we will always eat rice, meat, and fish. I come from a big family. I live with my mom, my sisters, and my brother here in the United States. My dad is here as well, but my parents are separated. In Senegal, I lived in a big house with my grandmother and my mom's mother and father. My mom's father had three wives, and many cousins, sisters, brothers, and aunties. We had many trees and a garden, chickens, cows, cats. We had a lot of animals in my home. Looking out the window, you will see people walking and many trees and cars going by. There were a lot of children around because my grandma taught classes. She taught children how to write and speak in Arabic. Wolof is our home language. Here I live with my mom, sisters, and brother. My sister and I lived with my father for one year. There were problems with my dad, so my mom came. My mother and sister are working. My mom came to help me and my sister. My dad has four wives and has a lot of problems and yells at us. I don't want to talk to anyone about my problems, but my friends say I should talk to someone. I do all the homework for my sister, brother, and my mother. Home is my family. I think of my beautiful house in Senegal. I think my, of my friends, my grandma, and the food. <laughs> I miss my grandmother. I think of my future in nursing to help people who are sick. I want to have a house in Senegal and a house here in both countries. Hey, good evening, hi. Uh, what's good? Hello? Hey. I'm just gonna keep saying shit until y'all say some shit back to me, you know what I'm saying? Thanks. Uh, can you give it up one more time for the brilliant young people of Open International? This is a fun, it feels like a chorus line. <laughs> so, so fun. Okay, uh, my name is Mark Bamuti Joseph, and I'm uh, the person that's gonna ask questions, I guess, and stuff, frame uh, 
the, the kind of tenor of the conversation unting like that. Um, how comfortable are you guys where you're sitting? Are you close enough? Do you want to get closer? Do you want to move your seats? Is this in okay shape for you? Yes? Sweet. Great. Yeah, you're getting better at the call and response thing. Awesome. So if, if at any point um, you just want to like lay out among the crew over here, I invite you to do that. Yes? All right. Cool. Um, uh, I would like to read for you a poem to begin. <clears throat> it's more of a short, it's, well, it's a piece of writing. So, um, me and the boy wear the same shoe size. He wants Jordan 4s for Christmas. I buy them and then I steal them from his closet. Like a twisted Grinch themed episode of Blackish. Uh, the kicks are totems to my youth. I wear them like mercury on my black man feet. I can't get those young freedom days back fast enough. Last time I was really fast, I was 16, uh, out running a doorman on the Upper East Side. He caught me vandalizing his building, not even on some artsy shit, just stupid. Of all the genders, boys are the stupidest. Uh, 16 was a series of barely getting away and never telling my parents. I assume that my son is stewarding this tradition well. 16 was the low end theory and Marvin Gaye on repeat. 16 is younger than Trayvon and older than Emmett Till. At the DMV, my boy is in line to officially enter his prime suspect years. Young brown and behind the wheel, a moving semaphore signaling the threat of communities from below. On top of the food chain, uh, humans have no natural predator, but America plays out something genetically embedded and instinctual in its appetite for the black body. America guns down black bodies and then walks around them bored like laconic lions next to half-eaten gazelles, bloody lips. America and the black body on some Nat Geo shit. The boy passes his road test at the DMV. He does this strut sea walk broken Fortnite thing on the way in to finish his paperwork. True joy and calibrated cool under the eye of my filming iPhone. The victory dance of someone who's just salvaged a draw. He's earned this win, but he's so 16, he can't quite let his body be fully free. When he's three, I'm in handcuffs in downtown Oakland. Five minutes ago, I was illegally parked and now I'm in the back of a squad car considering the odds that I'm gonna die here. 15 minutes away from my child who expects that in 18 minutes, daddy's gonna pick him up from nursery school. There are no pocket-sized cameras to fill this moment. So I learned a lot of big words at 16 getting ready for the SAT, but none of them come to me right now. In the police car, the only thing that speaks is my skin. I know this. I was parked in a bus zone on Broadway and 12th, running quickly to the ATM on the corner. I pulled the cash out just as a police car pulls up behind me. I give him the all shucks, my bad, that Robert Townsend, Ernest Blackface. I give him the, uh, oh, I'm out, I'm out, Ernest Urban for real though, that like Robert Townsend hits the siren, takes my license, hands on his gun. He comes back two minutes later, gun drawn, another patrol car now, four cops now, my face on the curb, hands behind my back, shackled. I'm angry and humiliated only until I'm scared and then sad. I smell like the last gas before my own death. I think of how long the boy will wait before he understands I'm not coming. I think how this, his last barely formed memory of me will be the story of why I never came for him. I try to telepathically say goodbye. The quiet brings me no peace. The silence makes it hard to rest. In the void there is anger mushrooming in the moss at the base of my thoughts. A, a fungus growing at the spine of my freedom attempts, I am free from all except contempt. A spirit of an unarmed civilian in a time of civil unrest. No peace, just Marvin Gaye falsettos arching like a broken winged sparrow, competing against the empty sirens, singing the police. 
apparently some cat from Richmond had a warrant out on him. And when the cop says my name to dispatch, the dude doesn't hear Mark Joseph, he hears Mike Johnson. I count seven cars and 18 cops on the corner, the pride around a pound of flesh. By the grace of God, I'm not fed to the beast today. Magnanimously, the first cop makes sure to give me a ticket for parking in a bus zone before he sets me free. My boy is 16 now, enough body to fill my shoes. I have gray in my beard and it tells the truth. He has a license to drive in the hollow city, to navigate traffic in the age of autonomous vehicles. People say the talk, like that shit happens just once. Like my memory's been erased and my internet is broken. Like I can't read today's martyred name. Like today's the day I don't love my son enough to tell him, bruh, I don't really give a fuck about your rights, yo. Your mission is to get home to me. Live to tell me the story, boy, get home to me. Today's talk is mostly happening in my head as he pulls onto the freeway and Marvin Gaye comes on the radio. At 16, inner city blues is watching black people commit to each other in love and parenthood on Spike Lee's cinema screen. At 42, I'm older than Marvin was when he made the What's Going On album and really curious how the fuck you make something so timeless before your time runs out. I'm wearing the boy's shoes and the tune in my head is the goodbye I almost never said. A goodbye the length of a wordless requiem, a length of a warning, a kiss, a whiff of his neck, the length of a revelation and a request. This is not to be romantic, but to assert a plausible scenario for the existential moment. Driving while black is its own genre of experience. It may not be the reason why you sing like an angel, but it surely has something to do with why heaven bends to your voice. The boy is driving. The cop in the rearview mirror is a ticket to ride or die. When you give a black boy the talk, you pray he is of the faction of the fraction that survives. You pitch him the frequency of your telepathic goodbye, channel the love sustained in Marvin's upper register under his skull cap. Black music at its best is an exploded black hole responding to the call of America at its worst. Strike us down, the music lives. Dark like tar and tobacco like cotton in muddy water. Get home to me, son, like a love supreme. A God as love, a love over rules, feathers for the angelic lift of the restless dead, like a theme for trouble man or 16 year old boy free to make mistakes and live through them, grow from them. Holy, holy, mercy, mercy me, mercy, mercy. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks. Thanks for um, indulging that moment. I wanted to um, share that particular work because it seems like the broad nature of our conversation is about safety, sanctity, vulnerability, and feeling hunted. It's uh, a really weird thing to be living in such an incredible city with such um, enormous resources and um, maybe be looking over your shoulder constantly because as a woman or a queer person or a trans person or a person of color or as a young person or as a poor person or as a creative person, it feels like um, this city is about everything but I don't know, the people I feel closest to. And the specter of that is what looms over this question of home. What you have here is a collection of folks that are um, through their work, their philosophies and through their missions are hacking that sense of danger from multiple communities. So um, before I ask the first question, I just um, really wanna begin um, the evening steadfast by um, just asking you to give um, like one initial burst of um, loving energy and round of applause for these people because um, these are the folks that actually make, make me feel safe. So I have multiple technologies going on. Um, 
these questions are um, formulated around um, a, a series of eight theses composed by, um, primarily by um, uh, a social practice artist and scholar um, named Doug Saunders, who talks about um, uh, cities that are arrival cities. In, in other words, um, when you come either from, when you come from another place, either from another country or you, uh, another city, you cross borders, why would you choose to live in a particular place? Why would you choose to live in a particular environment? And Saunders lays, lays out eight principles or values, which um, you can uh, get into, that make for an ideal arrival city. So the questions that I'm going to ask um, of the community that's assembled here um, is essentially how their work interfaces with one of the eight theses. Yes? Um, you'll get it in a second. Um, okay. Great. Put it down. Sweet. Um, my first question is for Danice and Sharon and Terrence. Yes, can you just like throw a fist up so we can see y'all? Great. Um, my question for each of you um, is if you could talk very briefly about um, how your work is an example of self-built solutions. Or how does your work put you in contact with solution-oriented people? How does your work um, how is your work an example of self-built solutions? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Me? Okay, hi, I'm Donise. I think for us at Lava May, the self-built solution sort of comes from many places. We take our cues always from the beginning from the people that we serve, the people that we call our guests, the people that we refer to not as homeless, but as our unhoused neighbors. And we feel that neighbors is integral to this. When I started this, I spent a lot of time on the streets talking to people, finding out what they needed, finding out what was missing, seeing some of the interesting solutions that they were coming up with themselves and recognizing, recognizing that in partnership with them, we could create something that was really vital and inspire others to do the same. We started with the Muni bus, and we took that and hacked it and turned it into showers and toilets on wheels. And just the other day, I was in Oakland, and I saw this gentleman who is a natural engineer, and he has created these beautiful solar-powered showers that are very rudimentary, but supremely brilliant. Every day when I'm out with our guests, I see people who are improvising their lifestyle and meeting their needs in a way that astounds me. Um, these are people who have been forced to, I guess the phrase is, um, necessity is a mother of invention. The level of creativity, um, piecing lives together, building communities that we are constantly disrupting and dismantling, and yet they persevere in the face of all of those odds. And I walk away on a daily basis um, utterly astounded by the people that I encounter and the way that they're fashioning their lives with dignity, with grace, and with brilliant solutions. So I feel like um, I am incredibly fortunate and lucky to get a glimpse into that and the way that they inspire us and our work is profound. Uh, yeah, so I'm Terrence and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, when I started my organization, before I started, uh, my wife and my children actually gave me permission to live as a person experiencing the plight of homelessness uh, for over a month. I lived on the streets, I ate out of trash cans, I was put out of shelters. Um, I had people walk across the street because I was walking with uh, many of my friends experienced in homelessness. Uh, I remember standing under a bridge in the middle of December, uh, burning do donated clothes in 13 degree weather uh, with many of my friends to keep warm. Yeah. 
Uh, one of the things that I learned is that about the ingenuity of many of my friends experience in this plight. Uh, they knew how to turn a water bottle into a sink. Uh, they knew how to turn donated clothes into firewood uh, and many other things. Uh, but there is a, a irony uh, because as I lived on the streets, I noticed that we had a lot of excess in our city. Uh, what I define as excess is anything over and above what you need to sustain your life. Uh, the city had abandoned buildings, it had abandoned houses, it had a lot of things that were sitting around that weren't being occupied or used. And so uh, I think the innovation for our organization literally came out of this idea of how much good could we do in this world if we leveraged our excess for good. Um, so we were inspired by people like Donice and we would turn an old church bus into a shower unit in a barbershop. Uh, we would uh, talk about this, this need for housing and use creative housing by having families donate RV units uh, to uh, create spaces where people could uh, literally get off of the streets. And in the last four and a half years, we've helped a little over 200 people to transition out of homelessness. Um, uh, we started seeing spaces like shipping containers, uh, which is our latest project we'll launch next year. Um, we are turning this shipping container into uh, a traveling museum that represents homelessness and poverty. Uh, when you look at the landscape, there are a lot of museums that represent a lot of different issues, but not many uh, that will speak to the fact of issues that will keep people who have many privileges proximate to those who are without. And so uh, one of the issues that we are addressing in our city is uh, the invisibility that exists when it comes to many of our friends. How can we make people more visible? And so we're, we're going to get a chance to be disruptive uh, with a shipping container because a shipping container in itself is too homeless. Uh, we'll travel from space to space and we will educate people um, who are totally unaware and uh, in, they believe false narratives about many of our friends experiencing this plight. Um, we've sectioned this container off into three sections, uh, which is challenging stereotypes, creating empathy, and mobilizing action. Uh, the people who will be showcased in this museum will be live people uh, that at the end of this museum will give our opportunity to our guests to actually help us transition them out of the plight. Um, there will be immersive content with virtual reality and technology that will give people an opportunity to be transported to the corner uh, to have people walk by them. Uh, they'll be transported under bridges or in abandoned homes to see what it feels like uh, to be in these spaces as a way of creating more empathy uh, in our world. Um, one of the, the ways in which we are getting more solution-oriented people involved in this is by giving people permission to dream of using excess to do uh, creative things to, to solve uh, real-world problems. Uh, like we've just helped start uh, a school bus that was converted into a computer lab uh, that will literally go to schools in impoverished areas and give uh, people who don't have uh, access to technology because of the di digital divide um, and access to that. Uh, we've helped people also start um, food trucks uh, that will cater to students who once they transition uh, from school. Uh, they have the only meals some children have eaten are, is, are, are the meals that they eat in school and so uh, we've been uh, giving people permission to dream and think of how to use excess in creative ways, and um, that's how we've been caring for it. Yeah. I'll chime. Am I on? I'm on. Yeah. I'll chime in. Uh, I'm Sharon, and I um, am the director at the Headland Center for the Arts, just over the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and some of you might know our organization. A few of our artists are involved in the exhibition upstairs. A few of them are out here in the crowd tonight. Um, and I'll 
briefly try to answer both sides of the question. Um, Headlands was founded about 37 years ago by a group of artists and activists, and what's particularly poignant about the founding of the organization was uh, that it was about taking back space that had been built by the military. So we're located in a former military barrack, uh, and so much of San Francisco's history, as many of you know, is really rooted in this design, right? This military defense, uh, this identity rooted in um, war. And the idea was that uh, these spaces could actually be repurposed and have different identities and really serve as um, a space for creativity, for new thinking, for exchange, for community. And so I really think of uh, those organizations, there was sort of a, a group of alternative arts organizations founded in that late 70s, early 80s era in the Bay Area as completely defining the ethos of how the arts function in this uh, area. There's sort of this activist spirit to it, this idea that artists have ways of seeing the world that other people might not, and that artists can actually be problem solvers. Um, and so that's a very big part of our program now is uh, supporting artists wholly as people um, based on how they think and who they are and the work they're trying to do and not necessarily about the commercial value of what they produce. Um, so, you know, I think sort of both fronts there, our, our purpose is really to invest in the people who we think have the potential to serve as the future leaders of our culture. And so by giving them what they need and not actually demanding something specific, we actually believe that's the most powerful way to create safe space. Thank you. Thank you to Sharon. Uh, the thesis, the arrival city is self-built. Uh, strict housing construction regulations should not be allowed to stand in the way of much needed self-built solutions. I'm gonna flip this a little bit. And dude, you're gonna hate me, but I'm not gonna use the microphone because I only have two hands in there. <laughs> and I'm also uh, gonna come here because I'm so far away from you. <laughs> so, you yeah, still hear me, yeah? Yeah. 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 All right, so, uh, here's the thesis. Uh, the arrival city is a network of immigrants. The arrival city is a network of immigrants. Ethnically homogenous districts enable community networks. Everybody hear the thesis? I'll say it one more time. The arrival city is a network of immigrants. Ethnically homogenous districts enable community networks. Everybody got that? Um, you have 15 seconds. In those 15 seconds, I want you to turn to the person next to you. I'm a performing arts guy, so we talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want you to turn to the person next to you, and given that definition of an arrival city as a network of immigrants, um, please tell me, uh, or please uh, tell your friend uh, what city you would land in as an ideal arrival city as a network of immigrants. Mm. You have 30 seconds. I feel like um, when it comes to homogenous areas in San Francisco, I feel it's sort of like the, um, 
the way the way the weather climate is here. Um, it's a bunch of microclimates of different uh, of different neighborhoods. Um, and I'm just speaking from my own experience of being being black, being African American, and not seeing a whole lot of myself when I walk through the street sometimes, um, and not seeing a whole lot of institutions that are uh, always uh, easy for me to navigate while I'm here in San Francisco. Um, and I guess that leads me to, the, to, your, to your other question about um, what is the importance of having these, uh, these places um, for my art, artistic practice. And, you know, I remember as a, uh, you know, when I started, first started thinking about art being some, something viable for me as a, as a young man, um, you know, always having to go out and do this extra research in libraries and um, look through, look for books, to, you know, to find those uh, windows and mirrors for people who look like me who, who made art. Um, and finding those people always, always, uh, filled, me, always filled me and it, uh, it gave me uh, a sense of a place that I, could, that I could be. And the importance for um, my continued practice for that is I really had to think about who I'm making this artwork for and ultimately I'm making artwork for and I'm relying on narratives regarding um, individuals whose, whose stories aren't always told on a, on a, on a, grander, on a grander platform or grander scale. So, um, and it's also something about just having a place to be, whether you're an artist or you're an engineer or you're, you know, you're a waiter or, you know, you're an, whatever you whatever you may be having that sort of that center that moral compass of uh people who are, are older than you are and people who are younger than you are um exchanging ideas and sort of giving you that guidance to matter no matter what direction your life may take you so um it's not always about having other artists around me that are black which which also it's it, it helps it's it, it's great to have, be able to have those dialogues and those conversations with people who look like you, but also just being able to have that, again, that, that center of people showing you how to get things done, mm. no, matter, you know, no matter what walk of life that you, you plan on taking. Okay. You know, I think about community. Um, when I first arrived to San Francisco uh, three days before 9-11, uh, what an interesting and powerful time that was and how much people came together at that time and it, it, this is kind of a, a silly metaphor but it's almost become like this smile that's missing teeth you know whereas before like the the way that you survived in the city it's like I I pretty much spent a lot of time in the mission and that's where I did a lot of my growing up here in San Francisco and my mechanic who would charge me five dollars to like fix my entire car you know Ulysses which was at the, in front of the general um, general hospital in the little the little um, restaurant where I could like splurge on a big meal that would only cost me eight dollars and 99 cents stuff like that where it allowed you to survive and figure your way out as, as you were building and constructing this language and all these a plethora of art centers and art institutions that were there to help you was what your community was, where that smile is missing teeth now. Mm. Ulises is gone, intersection's gone, you know, there's all these places that I feel have been extracted from that sustainability that sustainability of eco creative um world that i felt like so much held me and so now i you know as a teacher i'm always constantly like I, I used to be able to throw out 10 names and now I'm like, okay, go to YBCA. Okay, go to apply for the Headlands. These are the few institutions that are upholding and maintaining and sustaining those creative creatives that, you know, do dare seek out that lifestyle. But I feel like it's, it's becoming inhospitable. It's mm -hmm. becoming unsustainable because the people that help sustain that you know where was the mechanic or was the person that fed you or where was the person that like fixed your clothing for two dollars they no longer exist because they themselves had to flee they had to find somewhere else and so i think that it's like that gap uh, you know the, the the smile with you know five teeth missing it's I, I feel like it's like we're holding on to those teeth for dear life you know to keep 
keep creating and you know it, it, keep inspiring the students uh, that I, I I'm like you're so brave to go and undertake this this lifestyle because it is not it is it, it's not being supported by the community and the few people that do I I so much applaud them because it's come it's it's what's kind of keeping those conversations that are so imperative about sustainability, about home, about belonging, about reflection, about being able to see ourselves, you know, where do we see ourselves in this community? Right. And I think it's in conversations like this. So thank you. So thank you. Uh, here's the thesis. The arrival city needs the best schools. The arrival city needs the best schools. The worst neighborhoods demand the very best schools to educate local children. Everybody got that thesis? Could you please take 30 seconds? Uh, turn maybe to the person on the other side of you and just answer this question. Um, where in your education what is, what is the best memory of your elementary or middle or high school education? What is the best memory of being educated as a child? And maybe you're like the f sixth grade right now, or fourth or fifth grade right now. Anyway, what is your best memory of your childhood education? You got 30 seconds, share it. Let's bring it back. Let's bring it down. Let's bring it back. Hey, Katie. Um, what are what are the structures? What are the structures that your work puts in place to support vulnerable children? And could some of those same structures or ideas be applied to support creative communities? Up here. Is that for Katie? Yes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, to give a bit of background, too, I work for a nonprofit called Kids Need a Defense, and we represent unaccompanied children, so children who are in the immigration court system alone without a parent in court with them at least, uh, and kids who often are fleeing violence or fleeing really uh, difficult backgrounds to come to the U.S. and seek protection. Uh, and so KIND is composed of lawyers throughout the country, including here in the Bay Area, that represent them in immigration court. Uh, so one of the first things we do that I think is most tangible is just providing advocacy, providing a lawyer. Um, it's less than, you know, it's less of an abstract concept, but it's the most, I think, important thing for them. Um, we have clients as young as three years old that are in court alone um, and that could be subject to deportation if they aren't able to, to win their case, able to show that they are eligible for protection here. Um, so just having a lawyer with them in court is one huge thing. Um, and I think being advocates on a larger scale as well. So 
yes, we're lawyers, yes, we're doing the legal work as well, but trying to advocate that their stories are um, are out there, that their stories are known, sharing why children are coming here, breaking narratives, was mentioned earlier. So breaking narratives of what the story means to be an immigrant as like a large concept and really breaking that down into individual human stories and experiences is another way that we're advocating for and creating space for our clients. Um, and I think within that space, encouraging our clients to to, to live how they want to live. Um, many of them were kind of thrown into the situation. Maybe they had to leave their home country because of violence, because they didn't have a caretaker. Um, they were scared, they didn't know where else to go. And at the border were arrested by immigration, thrown into a jail-like facility, uh, thrown into shelters throughout the country, moved around, things they couldn't control on their own. Uh, so trying to create a space for them to live how they want to live and to make sure that they have the tools and information uh, that they can you know, best proceed, best open doors, best do things and have control and empowerment uh, moving forward. And I, mean, I think those are having advocates, having champions, and having allies um, are things that can tr uh, be transferable to other communities as well, not just working with the kids in our program, um, but you know, having people who are looking out for others, knowing somebody else's struggle, knowing somebody else's challenges, and being there for them, listening to them for guidance. I think a big thing there with our clients is you know, we're listening to them. What do they want? And then we can use the tools that we have as lawyers or other advocates to be able to hopefully meet those goals for them. I think that's something that other communities too, um, you know, having that support within and around um, can be really critical. Uh, one more game for Katie, please. Uh, two of these. Uh, thesis one uh, The arrival city is on the ground floor. The arrival city is on the ground floor. The success of a neighborhood is determined by the availability of small scale spaces on the ground floor. Uh, damn. Thesis two. Oh, I lost my page. But I know it. Um, the arrival city is affordable. <laughs> they laugh. The rival city is affordable. For cities to be attractive, rents must be low. I'm not gonna ask y'all to speak on this because we just gonna gripe. <laughs> so, Oliver and uh, Deborah, can you talk a little bit about how your work um, mitigates against the lack of affordable space uh, and how your work um, serves as a ground floor for distinct communities. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, not, I don't want to be very glib, but you're sitting in the solution that we came up with to affordability. Um, when Andy and I decided to embark on this project, it really was, um, at its core, real estate play. Um, as everybody, I don't have to tell anybody in this room, the real estate prices in the city uh, were just reaching a completely out of control point. About four or five years ago, um, galleries were closing and leaving. Artists were either moving to other cities or giving up their practices entirely. Arts nonprofits were hanging on, if they could, by their fingernails. Um, and there was no there there, you know? So that's, that was the impetus for building this. Our, our rents are all way below market. We've worked with our tenants to figure out the best way to utilize the common spaces that we have to further decrease their, um, their actual cost. Um, and we're really committed. You know, we're this, we call ourselves the stupidest landlords in San Francisco because we've imposed rent control on ourselves. Um, and as you may or may not know, there is no commercial rent control in San Francisco which is why, how we got into this problem in the first place. Um, so we're committed to keeping the rents low and the spaces open. And to answer the ground floor question, it was not a mistake that when we were working to design this space, we made our front door a great big old garage roll-up door. Um, we want this, we think of the space you all are sitting in now, sort of as Main Street. Um, as a place where anybody can come in, and that's really important. 
deeply, deeply important to us, is that we're, there are no barriers. There's no, you know, we've got a fantastic security guy. Hey, Sig. Um, but, <laughs> but it was very important to us that he actually be a greeter, that he not be, you know, a security guard in the traditional sort of stereotypical sense because we didn't want anybody to feel like they couldn't walk in, that this wasn't a ground floor open door space for them. And, um, and we, you know, we try very hard to encourage that. Um, so that's what I got. Uh -huh. Hello, uh, I'm Owen Levin. I work with the Community Arts Stabilization Trust. We're probably the second stupidest landlord in San Francisco. Um, uh, and kudos to you, by the way. You too. <laughs> um, so what we do, we have, we're a relatively young nonprofit. We're a nonprofit real estate development and holding company. We work specifically with small and mid-sized arts nonprofits to try and keep them from getting gentrified out of San Francisco and Oakland and the Bay Area in general. We have two projects at the moment. One is on Market Street, the luggage store gallery, which is a fine arts gallery. And then on Turk, um, the Counterpulse Dance Theater, which is obviously a dance troupe. Um, and our, so these two projects were developed using lessons we learned from social services. So we took a model that was kind of developed by affordable housing and switched it to try and use it in the nonprofit arts. Um, and so the two, our initial two projects are both lease to own projects where we went in and with the two arts partners, Luggage Store and Counterpulse, we purchased these buildings, we become partners and um, we used a tax mechanism called New Market Tax Credits, which is maybe the most boring thing I could possibly talk about. But. <laughs> Uh, if you want a long, deeply boring treatise, you can see me afterwards. Um, but uh, what, there's a seven-year period built into these tax, this tax credit financing structure. And so the two arts organizations, their rent is frozen at a very low level. I think at, at the moment they're paying about a tenth of market rate. And um, they have seven years to run the fundraising campaigns to eventually buy the buildings from us. Once they do so, we can take that money and recycle it into a new project working with a new set of arts organizations. So that's our initial first couple of projects and our first model. Um, Thanks. Um, <laughs> I'm enjoying it, I have to say. It's a real, it's an enormous pleasure working with these groups. Um, the pressures that we all know and feel around affordability in San Francisco and Oakland are really intense. They're particularly intense on immigrant populations and on long-term working class uh, populations and on the arts communities. These are all, all communities that don't make a ton of money that often exist in similar areas, often work together. Um, so while we, my organization ourselves, we don't do any direct work with any of these populations, we work through the arts organizations that we work with. Um, and those organizations tend to be deeply grounded in their communities, both in terms of the arts practice, but also their outreach into community. Counterpulse in particular, although luggage store as well, both of them, but the work they do, the, you know, the street scenes out in front of those two buildings can be a little rough. Um, and watching the way those two organizations interact with the folks that are milling around in front and the kind of community both the arts community that's grown up in those buildings, but also the arts community and local community that's become part of the street scene in front of them is really impressive. Um, yeah, I recommend very highly checking out both of those organizations. They're both very, very impressive. Thank you. Yasko uh, like Tabasco. Sweet. Uh, so my, my final question doesn't emanate from a thesis, but it is directed to uh, Taylor and Allison and T and Yasko, like Tabasco, who just joined us from Bosnia today, yesterday. Well, I'm actually, I like, I've been here 20 years, but yeah, I'm... <laughs> Did you just get off a plane like, I, no, I just, I'm just fucking up. So, anyway. Um, the, the question is this, and it's, it's directed to... Um, 
uh, many of the practicing artists, particularly those um, who haven't spoken it uh, at this point, but it, it's something that I'd like us all to consider as we kind of bridge this little bifurcated moment. Um, my question is this, um, how many great artists does it take to make a great city? How many great artists does it take to make a great city? You want to grab that first? Boom. So I, I don't think that the number actually matters. I think that what's most important about the artistic expression of a community is who those artists are as individuals and as creators. Because we see like in, in contemporary like mediums, you know, hashtagging intersectionality, but intersectionality is not actually intersectional if there's roadblocks. And w you know, with that is we, we were finding like the displaced have a voice, but because of their housing status, certain assumptions are made about the state of the displaced and so they're not being heard. And you know, like ha having been previously unhoused, people made all types of assumptions, you know, about my mental faculties, but then like I'm holding conversation and so now they think that this is a social experiment. And I'm like, it's not, I promise. You know <laughs> You know, it's a it's a matter of circumstance. But it's like I, I've been given a certain privilege to be able to have a voice and to be able to document and, you know, look at what those, you know, experiences of displacement being, you know, unhoused or an immigrant or even a transplant from another part of the country and what that looks like and what that sounds like. And the more that those voices that are traditionally marginalized, because there's several communities that are traditionally marginalized and, you know, great artists aggressively go out of their way to erase those margins because we have to think about it. It's like we always talk about like a seat at the table, but sometimes these tables are broken beyond repair and it's not worth fixing it and we have to be willing to build a new table and that's okay. But that's what makes a city great is looking at like who those artists are and do we actually have the diversity of voices and true intersectionality or they're just like a fad in order to promote a momentary cause. Um, with me, I've been, like I said, here 20 years. Um, I'm a refugee from former Yugoslavia, Bosnia. Um, moved a lot um, via Croatia, Germany as a refugee. Um, arrived to Kentucky, then Chattanooga, Tennessee as a refugee, then came to the Bay Area, been here now. Uh, yeah, 19 years, uh, mostly Oakland, Berkeley, now San Francisco. Um, I'm inspired by my friends who are artists, who are uh, um, uh, um, just people that shared, uh, shared themselves with me. Um, through my experiences, I've, um, I've seen the most beautiful uh, uh, things that humanity is, and at the same time, the worst. And um, I decided to uh, create art that, is, that speaks truth, that speaks now. Uh, memories and the unknown uh, uh, and, and for me I think again less the number but is it is there is there a vulnerability vulnerability in the art and the truth and a certain feeling that <laughs> that magic that you can explain and that connects and um, that that is the oxygen of who we are and um, yeah, I'm really, really uh, inspired by, by all of this right now. Thank you for uh, making this really a safe space, the way you are communicating with us, because I think it's, is it safe? Um, do we belong to a small community? And what are we doing with uh, our voices? Um, and then art is in everything as long as as, as it's honest and pure and um, and it connects with with uh, um, with all of us so um, I've seen a lot of changes in here in 20 years um, some really beautiful changes some not as good um, 
and um, we have a very interesting time right now. I've been in a very similar situation in, uh, in Yugoslavia in the 90s, just prior to the Civil War and, uh, and the tension before the war happened. And I can, I can smell it a little bit as well, that, that tension, what's happening here. But I feel like this country is, I, I wish it deals with its history more. Uh, and, and, and really goes deep into that, those feelings that, that, that a lot of people have. Um, and uh, I feel like art for a lot of us, for me personally, I go deep and it's, it's not pretty, but then at the same time I'm dealing with it and that kind of makes me go in and I, I, I um, uh, I evolve as a spirit and as a human being, and um, I feel like this country um, is the most amazing place um, and, and barrier, and, and um, just this country opened us so much to me that I want to do the same thing. Um, like I said earlier, I lived, I came, with, I didn't speak English at all, uh, came to Kentucky and then Chattanooga and I uh, I was in a high school it was 80% African American and, and I didn't speak English and the only way I could connect was through I knew how to play a little bit of basketball and uh, they were like where are you from uh, and, uh, and there was a famous player called Peja Stojakovic and I was Stojakovic for next next year and <laughs> Uh, that's all it mattered, but uh, they took me in and I, I, I really felt uh, I really felt uh, safe and that made me um, made me appreciate that part of American culture as well and uh, again um, art art is all about truth. So I'm not, I'm not sure how many great artists um, a, an arrival city needs, but I know that a city needs a great community of artists. And um, um, I feel like um, I, I moved to Oakland 12 years ago. Um, I, I've been in, in other artistic communities around the country, but I arrived in Oakland and um, I don't know, I feel like there's a lot of generosity in, in a good artistic community and that was definitely what, what I found when I moved to Oakland. Um, I feel like right now artists are really important in the Bay Area because, um, because of issues that have been discussed here tonight about invisibility and marginalization and um, I think that artists have a real comfort with ambiguity and a real discomfort with the idea of us and them and looking at people as an other if they are unhoused for example or they're recent immigrants I think it's really important to have um, to have people in the community who are willing to um, be generous and be creative and know the importance of telling stories um, a, a, a lot of the my, my art artistic practice is going into um, different homeless encampments around the East Bay and talking to people um, and just I find that it's I find that people are really dehumanized right now um, around the Bay Area especially you know economic refugees and people who who aren't who don't have the access to um, to social services or you know housing or other opportunities also sort of lose their status as human beings um, in the society and that's a big one thing that was really important to me and my um, my art partner Randy Koloski was just giving a little bit more of a voice and allowing people to tell their stories and also just you know shaking people's hands and and getting to know people and I think that if there was, I think that as, you know, the sort of artists who really welcomed me to the Bay Area when I moved here um, are increasingly getting pushed out, like it's really, um, 
it's really changing just sort of like the flavor and the texture of the Bay Area. And um, I think that we need to hold on to um, our willingness to be generous and our willingness to listen. And also, um, as artists who are making art from a place of privilege, just being able to sort of step aside occasionally and make sure that we aren't helping to marginalize and helping to create invi invisible peoples within, within the art community. Um, I think my favorite definition of an artist I ever heard was uh, an artist is somebody who looks around and sees what's missing and figures out a way to, to make it. Um, and a great city is one that doesn't let the arts die. Um, so um, maybe we find ourselves at a time where the things that are missing, the things that are needed are things like affordable housing or spaces for the arts. Um, and so maybe we find ourselves also at a time where maybe the, the world around us doesn't need another painting. Um, and so we have to be different kinds of artists who make these more socially embedded things possible. Um, and also maybe we need to uh, use our privilege as people who get to practice as artists to lift up other people who don't. Um, instead of hoarding the remaining resources. Um, so I suppose the question isn't so much how many, but what kind, as other people have said. Um, and most importantly, how much, how much spunk can you bring to the table to uh, clap back at all of the, the things that are squeezing the arts out of the city? So, Fem, we're, um, we're at the portion of the evening where, um, uh, it, where I think ordinarily, if there were questions uh, that came from the folks that weren't on a microphone, um, we would ask those questions. But I'm maybe going to ask us to do something different. Um, uh, because I, I would I would love to uh, continue this practice of uh, proximity and um, maybe responding to questions on a more intimate scale. So though the accumulated wisdom and intellect uh, over here and like amazing shoes uh, <laughs> is like here and, um, and balling, I'd, maybe I'd um, like us in the spirit of creating home to just get a little closer to one another. So the, the reason why my last question was about how many uh, great artists is because, as we all know, historically, certainly over the last 50, 60 years or so, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area has been the epicenter of weird in this country. Like, we are odd. And thank God. Because if not for the odd, then you don't have an edge. And if you don't have an edge, well, maybe it's not such a great country after a while. So somebody has to set the edge for this country. And I'd like to believe that the Bay Area over time has been um, that place. And so as we lose our artists or as um, this city, this area becomes less safe for artists to live and thrive and, and experiment, then we too get um, a little bit closer to losing our edge um, and certainly closer to um, a kind of eroding moral infrastructure, which I think gets illuminated by artists of, of all types. So um, if we could just kind of, um, I'll just kind of present this prompt and invite you to take uh, five steps forward and invite y'all to take 10 steps forward. And uh, just find somebody. And um, maybe let's just spend a few minutes together just being close. Uh, 
responding to the question of safety among our creative communities. How do we make this place more safe to be um, at our own creative edge? What are we doing in our own lives to approach our own creative edge? How do we make it safe for ourselves to be creative beings inside of this community and ecosystem? Yes? Great. Uh, let's migrate towards one another and see what happens.